Hello, you absolute legends. When it comes to considering the greatest and most important speedrunning games of all time, there are a few franchises that will always immediately enter the discussion. Super Mario, a series that houses not only the two most popular speedrunning games of all time in Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Odyssey, but also some of the most iconic speedruns ever, with runs of the game that started it all, often getting millions of views and widespread attention. The Legend of Zelda also has the honour of facilitating some of the most memorable speedruns of all time. All of the games in the franchise are popular in their own right, but A Link to the Past is especially well played. In terms of sheer influence, the Metroid series is a juggernaut. The original game on the Nintendo Entertainment System was one of the first to reward players for faster completion times. In 2004, the popularity of a Metroid Prime speedrun was the catalyst for the expansion of Speed Demo's archive, which would become the central hub for hosting and showcasing speedrunning videos. Up until this point, it was primarily used to host Quake demos, but would evolve into one of the most widely used speedrunning websites in the hobby's early days. And of course, there is Doom, the game that is arguably the most influential in all of speedrunning's history. The game that created the first bustling online community of dedicated runners that would compete and share demos through the internet, laying the foundations for speedrunning as a serious competitive venture. It's understandable why these properties would be popular in speedrunning. They have decades upon decades of nostalgic value and are ingrained in gaming culture. Everyone knows them, most have played them, many have loved them growing up. But these aren't the only heavyweights in the speedrunning realm. Plenty of newer and lesser known games have sprung up and become embedded in speedrunning culture, growing into some of the most heavily contested games. Of games that aren't supported by decades of previous installments or the backing of AAA publishers, none shine brighter than Celeste. Released in 2018, its popularity among speedrunners was instantly launched into the stratosphere, becoming one of the most run games in history. To give you an idea about how popular it is, the category for completing the game as quickly as possible with no restrictions, otherwise known as any percent, has the second most amount of runs submitted for any category for any game ever, losing out only to Super Mario Odyssey, a game that sold over 16 times as many copies. As a brand new property, developed only by a handful of people, Celeste could not rely on previously attained good favour, nostalgia, or a large publisher with deep pockets. With small indie games such as this, they can rely only on gameplay and mechanics to win over new potential players. And when it comes to mechanics, Celeste is the epitome of how a game should play in order to give birth to deep and meaningful competition. It is not chance that leads to Celeste's dominance as a highly contested game. It is the direct result of the way the game's protagonist moves through the world. In this video, we will examine the movement mechanics of Celeste and why it is the pinnacle of game design. You will learn precisely how movement should be designed in order to facilitate both an elusively high skill ceiling and also a nurturing environment for new players. I really hope you enjoy. Now a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, Skillshare. I am a huge advocate for learning and Skillshare is the perfect place to grow and develop. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for you to explore new skills or master your existing talents. As someone who has amassed various skills over the years, I went through a few of the classes I already had some expertise in, and I can confirm the quality is extremely high. The teachers really know their stuff. Recently, I took a class called Simple Productivity, How to Accomplish More with Less, taught by Greg McEwen, and it really helped me figure out what's important and what I should spend my time focusing on, now that I don't have as much free time as I used to. Now, Skillshare has allowed me to offer a two-month free trial of premium membership to the first 1,000 legends who click the link in the description. So please make sure to take advantage of this opportunity and start exploring your creativity today. On the surface, everything about Celeste is easy to understand. There is a very simple goal, reach the top of Celeste Mountain. In order to get to the summit, the game's protagonist Madeline, which the player controls, must successfully navigate her way through eight chapters. Each chapter representing a different theme, introducing new obstacles, hazards, and contraptions to learn and master. Chapters are broken up into small chunks, which serve as checkpoints. When Madeline dies, which will be often, she'll respawn at the beginning of the chunk. These individual sections of map can scroll laterally or vertically, but many of them will be contained within a single screen. 
Now, while we will delve into the mechanics of the game, which are the focus of this video, I do feel obligated to mention two other aspects that are worth noting. Everything about this game is a masterpiece, but the music is phenomenal. Secondly, the deeper meaning behind the premise of the game seems to connect deeply with many of its players. Madeline's journey up Mount Celeste serves as an allegory for overcoming her own inner demons. Celeste's message is one of encouragement and self-belief, a message of hope that with persistence and a positive attitude, you can achieve what was once thought impossible. If you have a goal, you should continue to strive to accomplish it, even when faced with the inevitable naysayers who not only eagerly lie in wait along your path to success, but also reside within your own mind. Great music and a captivating story aren't prerequisites for a popular speed game, but they certainly don't hurt. As a 2D platformer, the gameplay of Celeste is entirely focused around movement, very precise movement. The terrain is incredibly difficult to maneuver, generally taking many deaths before the player can successfully conquer it. With games like this, it is imperative that the player feels completely in control of the character, and in this regard, Celeste is on point. Madeline is extremely responsive to commands, and the physics of the game feel incredibly intuitive. The mechanics of Celeste revolve around three abilities that Madeline can execute, jump, climb, and dash. Jumping and climbing are self-explanatory, though Madeline can't climb forever, and when scaling vertical surfaces she will burn stamina and eventually fall. The dash ability is slightly more complex, but even still is fairly simple. Madeline can dash in only eight directions, vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. She can only dash once in the air, and must either touch down on a flat surface or collect a dash refill before being able to dash again. Madeline's hair will change color depending on the availability of her dash. Red, the default color, signifies dash is available. Blue indicates that her dash has been used. Three actions is not a lot, so in theory, learning how to move around and interact with the environment shouldn't take too much brain power to learn. And it really doesn't, which is what makes Celeste so easy for new players to warm up to. While the various chapters do contain different contraptions, moving pieces and collectibles that Madeline needs to learn to control, the base movement always remains the same. When I played through the game and completed the main story, I used these mechanics as they seemed to be intended, each of the three actions working as separate entities. When I needed to jump, I jumped. When I needed to dash, I dash. When I needed to climb, I climbed. But the true beauty of Celeste's mechanics emerge when these actions work in synergy. For example, if Madeline were to jump while dashing along the ground, she can perform a much faster jump, called a super dash, that covers more distance than the regular jump. This might seem obvious when explained, but it's surprisingly unintuitive for two reasons. The first is that players are trained from the get-go that you get more distance by jumping than dashing. This is in fact not true, but it was taught that way for a purpose, which leads into the second reason. Jumping first and then dashing is much easier to perform, as the timing window is larger. The dash is performed so quickly that it actually requires more skill in order to chain the actions together in the opposite order. The fact that the more effective and useful technique is harder to perform lies at the heart of why Celeste's mechanics are so amazing. Higher levels of precision are rewarded with higher levels of movement efficiency. To further demonstrate how Celeste embodies this principle, the super dash that we just learned can be broken down again to another level. The timing window in which you can jump after dashing to perform a super dash can be split into two parts. If you jump early, immediately after dashing, Madeline's hair will turn blue, indicating that her dash has been spent. This is because the dash has a cooldown, which means that even if you're touching the ground during a dash, it won't reset until the cooldown has expired, which is indicated by Madeline's hair turning white. So if you jump up from the ground before the dash cooldown has expired, the dash will not have a chance to reset. On the other hand, if you delay your jump slightly, allowing the dash to reset, you can reap the benefits of the super dash while keeping the ability to dash again while still in the air. This is obviously beneficial because an extra dash allows you to cover more distance. This is called an extended dash. The fact that there are two potential outcomes of the super dash with differing levels of usefulness based on your level of input precision wasn't an inevitability. This stems entirely from good design. If less effort was spent on this aspect, the super dash could have always resulted in a spent dash, no matter how you timed it. Alternatively, a super dash could have always resulted in another dash being available. Rewarding the player for higher precision raises the skill cap dramatically. This allows players to fully express their skill through their movement, 
When the speed of movement in of itself takes higher levels of skill, this will always breed competition and hook players. Another great example of this is Super Mario 64. Here as well, the speed at which the player can move is directly tied to their level of input precision. One of the core techniques used is the forward dive followed by a rollout. This combination of actions allows for the most efficient movement, but the speed that you can maintain after doing the rollout is entirely dependent on how well you time it. Getting the maximum amount of speed requires frame-perfect inputs. If you time it too slow, you'll lose a ton of speed. Because this technique is used so many times throughout the run, it allows for variants of skill to manifest in huge time discrepancies among players. Casual viewers might be drawn towards the flashy glitches and crazy strategies when they watch these speedruns, but the reality is that most of the time gained or lost is through the subtle perfections or imperfections of movement. For a comparison, we can take a look at my own choice of game to speedrun Goldeneye. Here, movement speed is binary. In order to move at full speed, I would only need to hold down a button. There is no amount of skill or lack thereof that would change the speed at which Bond runs. While there is obviously skill involved in precision of turning and aiming, the skill ceiling can ultimately never be as high. The designers of Celeste not only increased the complexity and depth to individual movement techniques, but also broadened the scope of techniques as much as possible. Whenever there was a chance to create new mechanics, the opportunity was taken, especially when it comes to interacting with the terrain. Madeline is able to jump off walls, but doesn't get much height. If you dash up a wall and perform a jump mid-dash, the resulting jump gets much more height. But the extra height isn't simply a carryover from the momentum gained from the dash, but rather is an entirely new emergent mechanic. There is normally a limit to how high Madeline can climb due to the finite reserves of stamina, but again, with skill and good technique, you can use wall jumps to climb indefinitely. There are honestly too many techniques to go through, but the common theme is that Celeste will almost always provide room for creativity and skill to be the limiting factor. We talked about the super dash before, but this idea of dashing into a jump can be performed many different ways with each variant offering different results. You can perform a hyper dash, which is lower, faster, and longer. You can dash down into the ground and perform a wave dash. You can dash in one direction and then quickly reverse your momentum to super dash the other way. The combination of many different potential techniques, each having various levels of effectiveness based on skill level, culminates in a complex problem speedrunners must attempt to solve, finding the optimal strategy. In each screen, the terrain is different, requiring different solutions, and with so many different mechanics available, the task of figuring out how to navigate each screen in the quickest manner is a huge one. Speed isn't the only factor speedrunners need to consider, as consistency is paramount. The skill ceiling in Celeste is so high that the quickest movement is often not even attempted, as the odds of performing it successfully every run is too small. As the players get better, the movement patterns they choose to incorporate become progressively more difficult. Because there are so many solutions to each screen, there is always a plethora of stepping stones available for players to incrementally ramp things up. This serves to always motivate players to improve, as the next optimization is never too far away. Over the years, I've seen a lot of different speedruns of many different games, and I can truthfully say that Celeste speedruns showcase some of the most impressive and awe-inspiring technique you could ever witness. There is no luck involved in the game whatsoever, so the fate of each run lies squarely in the hands of the player. Celeste has already become a staple in live speedrunning tournaments, providing some of the most exciting matches we've seen. Watching high-level play is crazy. The skill of the top players translates so obviously into how they move through each level. The lack of RNG means that head-to-head -head races become even more intense, as the playing field is completely even. I think it's likely in the coming years that we're going to see some very large events showcasing this game, and its popularity as a game to speedrun will only grow as time goes on. Celeste is a masterclass on how to design movement in a platformer. The ultimate takeaway is that platformers should always, where possible, allow players to access more effective and useful mechanics by skillfully combining existing mechanics, whether it be through tight timing windows, specific combinations of actions, or both. If further complexity can be added, it should, as long as it builds upon and doesn't interfere with the base level mechanics. I will put a link to a couple of choice Celeste speedruns in the description. Go check them out and prepare to have your mind blown. 
thank you so much for watching, you legends. I hope you are having a fantastic day, and I will see you in the next video.